our third speaker is Gabriele Montalvano, who is a student at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Études at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Vudu. Um, he has been Benedetta Smartbook Pro. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Gabriele has been working on uh, the Italian community in Tunisia. He will be, some of his work will be published in a collective volume that is coming out next month in April. And he will be speaking to us today on Colonize the Colonizers, the Southern Question, Italian Colonialism and Orientalism in the Italian community in Tunisia in the 19th and 20th centuries. Hello, thank you to everybody. I want to thank you the organizers of this conference, especially Takarnagi and Dia Tutas. So, in this paper, uh, I will explain the striking aspects of the Italian community in French Tunisia and how we can understand it through the Italian Southern question. My goal here is to apply the concept of internal colonialism as Michael Etcher did for the Irish case. Furthermore, I will use the category of Italian Orientalism as it theorized by Schneider. Both authors base their perspective on the Gramscian analysis of the Southern question in the light of post-colonial studies and especially Edward Said's Orientalism. To relate these models and concepts in an Italian historical background, it was also useful the John Dickey's book Darkest Italy, the Razza Maledetta of Vittorio Teti, and the book of David Forgar's Italy's Margins. Immigration, internal and external colonialism, and racial discrimination are issues concerning with the case of Italian community in Tunisia. The necessity of a, a deeper approach which led me to these readings came from the complexity of the subject itself. What is that makes the Italian community in Tunisia so special in comparison with others and bigger Italian immigrated communities in the late uh, 19th and early uh, 20th century? In order to explain it, I will point out, point out some historical, social and legal distinctive traits that made this community a unique case in the history of Italian immigration. The presence of Italian Tunisia dates back to the late Middle Age, when Genovese and Tuscan merchants go to Tunisia for commercial trade reasons. Nevertheless, it's only during the 17th century that a several community took place when a group of Jews from Livorne settled in Tunisian port cities. The Jews of Livorne formed a small merchant elite that was the core of Italian upper class until the 20th century. This Italian bourgeois spread in Mediterranean cities remains strongly attached to the Italian national idea as it is demonstrated by their engagement during the, during the Italian unification. But what the, made the Tunisian case peculiar is something that started with the instauration of the French protection upon the Tunis Regency in 1881 with the Treaty of Bardo. As the French protectory was sponsoring public works like railways, harbors, mines, and so on, a huge amount of southern Italians emigrated in Tunisia looking for a job. The journey was very easy. It took only one night from Palermo to Tunis by boat, and it was cheaper and less tragic than Atlantic migration to the United States or South America. I came from Rome, and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, moreover, the price of agricultural lands in Tunisia were cheaper than Sicily, than in Sicily, and a condition that encouraged the installation of peasants and landowners in the Regency. This migration at the end of the 19th century completely modified the social composition of the uh, Italian, com Italian community in uh, 1901, the Italians in Tunisia were approximately 90,000 and the southerners represented at least 90% of them. Italians were more than French and the colonial environment between the two European nations was quite rough. In fact, liberal Italy looked at Tunisia as a future colony, so when in 1881 France uh, conquered it, the Italian Prime Minister at that time, Cairoli, dismissed from then on, some colonialists and nationalists considered Tunisia a proof of the political weakness of the governments in colonial and international issues. Tunisia became an unredeemed colony. So, the Italian elite of Tunisia had to deal with a bulk of southern migrants with their compatriots and the French colonial authority. The establishment of the protectorate on Tunisia meant that the French sovereignty formally was not total as in Algeria. 
As Virus writes in her book, The Divine Rule, the juridical status of a protectorate was quite ambiguous. A protectorate was not a colony but almost. French authority couldn't approve laws in Tunisia without the signature on, and the approval of the Bay, the King of Tunis. In addition, some international treaties with other countries made by the Bay before the French protection, like the ones with Italy and England, had to be honored. By the time the Italo-Tunisian Treaty of uh, 1869 expired in 1896, new conventions were made between Italy and French about Tunisia. After a time colonial defeat in Adwa, the fall of Crispy government, French was pursuing friendly relations with the Kingdom of Italy. The intention was to take it off from the alliance with Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. <coughs> Italy had to officially recognize the French rule in Tunisia, but some important privileges were still accorded to Italian citizens. The Convention of 1896 formed the juridical structure to the Italian community of Tunisia. The Italian citizenship was granted to their offspring, and schools, association, the colonial hospital kept a separate juridical status from French authority. Newspapers, banks, industries and shops run by Italians could continue without restriction. To sum up, French didn't have the power of compulsory naturalization on the numerous Italians living in Tunisia and neither were able to inspect or close the Italian schools and association. <coughs> Only individual naturalization was possible. Even though the convention restricted the Italian presence to a fixed number of schools and, asso and associations without any possibility on paper to increase them, they gave to Italians a legal national structure in a foreign colonial, oh, uh, foreign colonial uh, country. Owing to this international treaty, Italians in Tunisia could live with their own schools, their hospital, own properties and associations virtually without any contact with the French influence. In truth, the main part of Italian workers was employed in French public constructions. But it's not meaningless to point out that the Italian associations were ruled by the bourgeoisie and the consulate and the consuls from central and northern Italy. Little by little, other entrepreneurs and big landowners integrated this elite that was originally composed by only, only by Jews. This bourgeois elite was patriotic and nationalist and through their association and schools wanted to manage the huge mass of Sicilians, Sardinians and other southerners who formed mainly the European working class of Tunisia. As said before, Tunisia had an important role in Italian-French relations and the Italian community, that was bigger than Frenchmen, was a noteworthy issues issue in the discussion between the two governments during all the colonial period of Tunisia until the Second World War. So, the importance of the community, thanks to southern emigration, increased the importance of the Italian bourgeoisie of Tunisia, the very viewers of this community. With a big community, they could play an important role toward French colonial authority and Rome. The maintain of citizenship and the rest of the privilege made the case of Italians in French Tunisia an enticing exception in the history of French colonies and in, the, and in Italian immigration as well. The relationship between a small cultivated nationalist elite with a mass of workers and peasants reproduces, reproduces the Italian liberal society with its vices. The Treaty of 1896 built and established a political center of the Italian community ruled by the Lebanese Jews industrial and Italian consulate. Associations, schools and other national structures formed an Italian web in Tunisia focused on the national identity, Italianità, Italianness. If we consider, as Jules Sorin did in his book L'Invention Sicilienne en Tunisie, the Italian community on Tunisia, like a state within the state, we have to underline that this state didn't have geographical but social and legal boundaries. To me, it's possible to affirm that this community at the center and a periphery. The core, the capital of Italian Tunisia, was the consulate and the Italian chamber of commerce. The latter was the most important among the Italian associations. It included all the biggest Italian entrepreneurs and landowners, the commercial and social elite of the community. The chamber of commerce was a kind of a parliament in which the common problems of Italian Tunisia, the bourgeois ones, of course, were discussed and his newspaper, L'Unione, was the most spread <coughs> Italian newspaper in Tunisia. The consulate was the high of Rome in Tunisia, gave the legal and diplomatic assistance to their citizens and financed through the funds of the Minister of Foreign Affairs the national activities, festivities and associations. The center of the national power and national identity lied in this equilibrium between the local bourgeois and the consular authorities. The periphery was a social periphery that meets a social class far from this elite who wanted to manage the immigrants through their association. 
Though immigrants workers who were the majority of the community, they led uh, the margin of this Italy in Tunisia, or better, Italy within Tunisia. They were the objects and never the subjects of the uh, philanthropic activities of the bourgeois associations. The associations like Società de Alighieri, Società Italiana di Beneficenza, Società di Mutuo Soccorso, were the link between elite and mass, the tools of the bourgeoisie to spread their values and to build their social power. This Italian web was the structure of the cultural hegemony of Italy upper class on Tunisia upon its proletariat. The need to nationalize the migrants from south, mainly an alphabet, poor and without strong national identity, was necessary from a national point of view in that colonial context. In fact, the young Italian state had to show his power, and even if Adwa marked a stop in colonial conquest, Italian colonialism was still alive. Tunisia, as Le, Le Rabulio said, was an Italian colony ruled by French people. So Italians in Tunisia, overall the nationalist upper class, had to be like the colonizers. But how to claim to be colonizers if the great majority of your people is in rough social conditions? This problem was the greatest con contradiction for the Italian nationalists in Tunisia and also in their motherland. In Italy, nationalists and colonialists saw in emigration and national humiliation not worthy for a country who wants to be an international power. It's not meaningless that Corradini, leader of the Nationalist Party, wrote about colonialism and necessity to stop immigration in foreign countries, giving the example of Italian Tunisia. The success of the Italian immigration in Tunisia, according to nationalists, proved the colonialist attitude of Italian people against the weakness of Italian governments who let the people go. Immigration justified the colonial expansion of Italy. Italian colonialism was the solution to the southern question and to the Italian diaspora. Without considering the necessity of a land reform in southern Italy and its economic underdevelopment, they wanted in 1911 to conquer new lands in Africa, in Libya. Here, what, uh, what I would call the Italian exception, the civilizing mission of colonial Italy was justified by the immigration of southerners, but these ones were considered, were, were considered as to be civilized. If the upper class had national feelings, not the same could be said to the majority of migrants spread all over the world. In the national project, these migrants had to be nationalized, Italianized, to become the future colonizer of the greater Italy. The social disaggregation of southern society, the stereotype of a southern as another, a half savage who was to be civilized, colonized, colonized uh, is striking and evident in our Tunisian case. The Italian consul of Tunis, Tommaso Carletti, in 1905, in, a, in an official consular report about the conditions of Italian community of Tunisia, he wrote, I quote, The common psychology of our community is the psychology of the Sicilian race. Our community is a little image of Sicily in tiny dimension with a Tunisian background. These Sicilians, these Sicilians transplanted in Tunisia, had lots of flaws and deficiencies that came from, in part, the misrule in their homeland, and impaired surfacing from, in Italian Trampolanti, their ethnic essence. The total ignorance in which most of them are swamped comes from the first cause, the misrule. We didn't care to educate them, to smooth the rough edge of them, in Italian dirozzarli, to refine them, ingentilirli, to plane them, piallarli, if I may so. We let the growing up rough and savage as nature educated them. From the first cause depends their immorality, that, that doesn't come from a corrupted nature, but from ignorance of the evil. Nevertheless, we can find among the Sicilian population some proofs of a moral superiority. End quote. It's quite evident the paternalistic attitude of the consul Carletti towards the workers of the community. The Sicilian is seen as a child without education, not willingly evil, but all ignorant of what good is. When Carletti wrote, we didn't care to educate them, who is this we? It can't be we, the Italians, because in this way he admits that Sicilians are not Italians. They don't belong to the national community. That we is, according to me, we the builder of the nation, meaning the cultivated nationalist elite that was in Tunisia mainly from central and northern Italy. The white man's burden of civilization had to be applied to compatriots to make them truly Italians. But the racist reference that he made in his report showed us the racial discrimination in the community was current. The idea of a Sicilian race different from the rest of northern Italians came from the positivistic social analysis that Andy Lombroso is exponent, as Mr. Christopher said yesterday. 
The ethnic essence justify their economic underdevelopment and explain the social exclusion from the upper class. The cultural construction of a southern Italian race influenced not only the homeland but also the immigrated communities in which northerners and southerners lived close. The distinction in our case studies was also an urban one. The quarter of the Sicilians of Tunisia were distinguished from that of the Italian upper class who lived in the European colonial quarter with French colonizers. Like the difference between the center and the eastern Italy, also Italy within Tunisia had urban differences who underlined the social ones. Sicilians of, uh, Sicilians of Tunis lived in a quarter close to the port called Petite Sicile that was built on a swampy soil and a little and poor house which most of all were built without permission of the council of the city. This social and we can suggest racial division was replied in all Italian urban settlement in Tunisia. Like in Sousse, in the south, there were two quarters called Capaci Grande, Big Capaci, and Capaci Piccola, Little Capaci. The name came from a little bit of village called Palermo. These quarters were seen by French authorities as dangerous and full of criminality and illegal business. In addition, the rivalry the real between France and Italy and Tunisia had as a central point how to manage the Sicilians. French authority wanted to naturalize them in order to assimilate into French community. Italian upper class, as we have seen earlier, and its interest to Italianize them. According to a French report concerning the Italian question in Tunisia, the national feeling wasn't so strong among Sicilian immigrants. Speaking about the Capaci quarter in Sousse, the controller civil of that town declared, Les habitants de ces quartiers appartiennent moins aux Italiens qu'aux Maltais ou aux Français, quoi qu'en pensent les consuls d'Italie. Ce qu'il y a de positif, c'est qu'en fait, les familles italiennes vivent dans ces milieux avec le sang gel et la promiscuité qui sont en Sicile. On croira des larinières. Il est malheureux que la société française n'ait pas, pas pu se passer des Italiens, mais enfin, ils restent sous le contrôle français et ne peuvent aller plus loin que le, que ne le permet. French colonial society in Tunisia couldn't do without Italian immigrants because they were the working class for French industries. Even though the controller defined this situation unlucky, he asserted that French power is strong and Italian works that couldn't jeopardize the stability of French Tunisia. It's not worthy that uh, how in this kind of description low economic conditions are accompanied by moral judgments about supposed Sicilians' manner. In few words, the court of Sicilians is described as a spot in which they exported the promiscuity from their Sicilian homeland. According to the controller, no national feelings belong to them, whatever the Italian consul may say. French authority bet to their national differences, indifference towards Italy to persuade Sicilians to become Frenchmen. But the Italian bourgeoisie tried to stop the French influence on Sicilian masses through association in schools. And a lot of philanthropic associations helped poor children of the community, paying them food and instruction. Dante Alighieri Society, through its local committees, found lots of private schools to teach Italian and at the Anatobes entrance. In 1802, teachers and intellectuals of the Italian community founded the Association for the Italian Popular University. This association organized some evening teaching class in Italian to the workers. The items concerned a different subject, but all with the idea of a moral, social, and national uh, development. Lessons on Italian national history, hygiene, and uh, actualities were frequent. The case of Italian Popular University of Tunis is an example of the civilizing attempt from upper class to the lower. So, we have seen how the southern question was still present and strong even in foreign contexts among Italians. Social and economic differences that were structural within the Italian state had been important in the immigrated communities. Discrimination against the southern underdevelopment and the interest to maintain it persists in the Tunisian case, even if it was with some different reason in comparison with those uh, in Peninsula. But as we have seen, there were some aspects that were quite original and came from the colonial condition. A specific point was the link between Tunisian immigration and Italian colonization in Libya. The work of the southern migrants, migrants in French Tunisia pre-announced, according to nationalists, the success of the uh, Italian colonization in Libya. Lots of pamphlets and articles on newspapers in Tunisia as in homeland said that Italian Tunisians were the example of the national colonialist uh, attitude of Italian people who, through hard works, can make flourish the desert. The uncivilized Sicilians of Tunisia became, in this way, the unaware avant-garde of Italian colonialism. Their uncivilized manners the unskilled work and the poetry who push them to any rate are opposed to the French bourgeoisie colonialism and their capitals. We can quote what Corradini wrote 
during his travel from Tunis to Tripoli about a visit to uh, Sicilia, Sicilian peasants in Tunisian countryside. What the little Pantelleria, it's a little island in the south of Sicily, what the little Pantelleria does to a plot of land, France wouldn't do neither for the richness of the five continents because France is too charged of its high civilization and its corruption. Pantelleria, instead, grows in the sincerity of its primitive life. I saw that rough men of Pantelleria among their new wines in the plain of the splendid Gulf of Hamamet were spring already bleed. I knew lots of those Pantellereschi, airy and almost nicker. They were people of the sea and then they emigrated. When the colonialist invasion in Libya began, the nationalist propaganda and the hostility of the Arab population pushed, pushed the Sicilian of Tunis to join the Italian colonialist discourse. Some convoy of Italian workers were sent from Tunis to Tripoli in order to build the military defenses and trenches to the Italian army in Tripolitania. Where well, there was not any kind of anti war or anti colonialist demonstration from the Italian immigrants in Tunisia. Popular reaction supported the colonialist initiative of the Jolitis government. The Italian leader would be the realization of emigrants in Tunisia. It meant, moreover, a passage from the humble status of emigrant in a foreign colonial country to, uh, to that of colonialists. National discourse presented the war as an occasion of social promotion for Sicilians in Tunisia, despised by French authority. The action of the nationalist bourgeoisie and the working class succeed. They colonized those primitive Sicilians, making them Italians now ready to colonize Libya. <laughs>